Today we'll continue speaking from where we left off yesterday, discussing the business of chati or birth. This this kind of birth isn't the kind of birth that is a coming out from the mother's womb. This birth is a mental kind of birth. It's like the birth of a spirit or a ghost. So we could call it a spiritual birth. It has nothing to do with physical birth. The physical birth from the mother's womb, it happens just one in a lifetime and then it's over with. But this kind of mental rebirth can happen many, many times, even in a single day. This is why we say that when there is craving tanha, then there will be there will be birth, this kind of mental or spiritual birth. Every time there is danha, there will be birth. We say that we are born out of danha, born out of craving. We could also just as well say born from attachment, from upadana, or born from bhava, from existence. As we explained yesterday, <coughs> birth arises out of all of these, but we, are mo- we most often say born from craving. This is the traditional way to express it. And craving is, is called Ponopavika. Ponopavika. Which means to leading towards birth, leading to birth, to, to new birth. So this birth will always occur if there is danha craving. When there is craving it leads to birth and so there's that, there's looking or searching for a place to be born for a birth. And then there's, from craving, there's upadana, that sense of I and mine. And then there's bhava, existence. And then the ego, the ego is developing and then the ego is, is born in some way or another. And so this is chat or chati, which inevitably follows upon danha, upadana, and bhava. And so we say that every birth is dukkha, every birth, every, every time there is birth, then there is, is suffering because this is the birth of an ego. When ego is born in this way, then within that birth there are all, all the problems we can experience. There are all the burdens of life within that, within that birth. And so if birth is all the problems and all the burdens of life, it's quite, it's quite natural to say that every birth is is dukkha. But this is something not to to learn from books or from from other people's words. It's a fact that we must learn within ourselves by observing how this occurs within ourselves. Because we don't we don't know this, however, because we haven't learned this fact, then we keep on getting born. The ego keeps getting born over and over again, and so we keep falling into dukkha. We're unable to to prevent dukkha because we haven't learned this fact yet. When birth is the condition, then all the different forms and kinds of suffering occur. All the forms of suffering like 
like getting old, dying, all kinds of sorrow and fear and everything. All of these only occur once there is birth as the condition. One of the secrets of, of this that nobody notices, by the way, is that as soon as there is this birth of the ego, as soon as this ego exists, then it takes everything that exists naturally as mine. All the things that occur naturally are then are accumulated or grabbed up by the ego. And so things like getting old, becoming sick, and dying, which are just natural phenomena, are, are claimed, are identified by, with, by the ego. And so it becomes my getting old, my sickness, my death. In this way, all this dukkha arises. And all kinds of natural activities just kind of actions within the body and mind which occur naturally are taken to be mine, mine. Things such as physical pain or mental, mental pain, suffering, um, sorrow, despair. These are just naturally occurring things. But when chanti has occurred, these are all taken to be mine. And so they create great suffering. Or when we are separated from the things we love, the things we like, or then when we have to endure things we don't like, when we have to live with and experience things we don't like, or then when liking things and not getting those things that we want, these all become suffering. This, these are all just natural things. It's, that's just the way it goes. Being separated from what we like, enduring what we don't like, and not getting what we want. This is just the way it goes in the world. But if we attach to this all as mine, then there are problems for us. And so we, we summarize all the dukkha by saying that dukkha is attaching to anything as I or mine. Whenever there is the least bit of attachment to something as I or mine, then there is dukkha. Or we could state it in this formula. The birth of ego is the birth of suffering. This is something that must be experienced with, within our own, our own hearts and minds. It's something we have to feel within ourselves. It's not possible to learn this from, from books. You can't get this kind of understanding merely by reading, reading books. We have to look inside ourselves, observe <clears throat> what happens within our own minds until we know what, what upadana is. What is this thing, attachment? And then what is bhava, existence? And then what is the chati, the birth, that follows on the bhava? And then, until so we see all these stages of the ego, when we see this clearly within our own experience, this is the only way to understand this, this heart. These things are the heart of Paticca Samupada. And the only way to understand this heart of Paticca Samupada is by looking deeply into our own inner experience. Next, we'd like to look and see how this stream or, of Paticca Samupada occurs in in daily life, how this happens in each and every day of our ordinary life. It begins with 
what we call the inner ayatana, ayatana which are things that experience, and the inner ayatana are the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, and then the nervous system associated with that. We have these six inner ayatana, and then there are outer ayatana, <coughs> which correspond with the inner ones. So there are forms, things that are seen, sounds, smells, tastes, physical sensations or touches, and then mental experiences. When the inner ayatana and the outer ayatana strike each other or collide, then there arises vijnana. And there are six kinds of vijnana, eye vijnana or eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, and so on. The, we can give an example starting with the first pair. First, there's the, there's the eye, and then there's the sight or form. These collide, the light waves or whatever strike the retina. And then eye consciousness comes in. These three together we call patsa or contact. This yes. is how it all starts. If these three things, the eye, the sight or form, and eye consciousness come together and are functioning together in the same, in the same action. If they're functioning together, we call this patsa, patsa, which can be translated contact or, or sense impression, these three things working together. There are two levels or stages to this patsa. The first is when there is just the physical the basic physical contact between the eye and the, the object, or the, and so seeing takes place, and we can see the shape, the form, the color, and everything. But this is just a, a very basic seeing. This kind of patsa we can just call mere contact, or pure, just contact. But as soon as that occurs, then the, the second Patsa can come in immediately. This is when the mind arises and knows the meaning of that, that whatever is being seen, the mind knows the meaning, knows what to call it, can, can label it or whatever. The second time we could call sense impression. So we have these two stages of Patsa which occur throughout throughout our daily experience. The first is just the basic level of knowing the shape, the color, the physical dimensions and qualities of the, the experience. And then second is when the, the mind kicks in, especially mind consciousness, mano vijnana, mind consciousness comes in and sees the meaning, understands what to call this thing. And this is when there is full contact, where this experience now has meaning for the mind. These are the two levels of, of patsa or contact. One is an external kind of contact, and then one is where it has fully made contact has fully impressed the mind. And however it is with the, the eyes, as we've just described, contact with the, through the other sense doors, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body and the mind sense work in exactly the same way. All the senses work in the same way basic way which we're describing using the example of the eye.
then <coughs> if there is if mindfulness and wisdom are lacking this contact will take place under within ignorance or under the power of not knowing and so when contact takes place with ignorance then it's a foolish kind of contact because mindfulness did not bring wisdom to the experience now patsa is the condition for vedana for feeling when the contact is stupid because of the lack of wisdom then the feeling will also be foolish so foolish contact ignorant contact leads to feeling which is ignorant and foolish this is what is the the standard situation in our lives because we've never understood what's taking place so most of the vast majority of contacts and feelings which arise are foolish and then feeling is the condition leads to tanha craving when feeling is foolish when there's this stupid feeling it's inevitable that desire will be be stupid as well and this foolish desire we call we call craving so from the foolish patsa there's foolish feeling and then we have craving which is a stupid desire in one form or another and then craving leads to attachment when there's this this stupid desire then it it leads to attachment to foolish attachment clinging to things foolishly this is very important this point right here how because there is this blind stupid desire it it conditions it brings up it causes upadana blind or foolish attachment when contact <coughs> is stupid it it brings up stupid feeling and then stupid feeling brings up craving and then stupid when there's this craving that brings up this stupid craving brings up attachment which is also stupid so it's stupid 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 from step to step to step it's all happening foolishly this condition of stupidity in all these stages must must be observed until seen clearly therefore the ego the self the soul whatever we call it is a product of stupidity the arising of self of ego comes out of this process this flow of stupidity this is a very important point to be noticed and understood that that what we take to be self or ego is merely a product arising out of foolishness then from this upadana's concept of i in mind then there is bhava existence the the ego now exists in the mind it's established in the mind we call this bhava and that leads to chati birth once the concept of i is established in the mind then it is born complete the ego is born out as i as ego as i am which we call chati birth once there is this this stupid ego it takes everything this stupidity of ego 
takes everything that makes contact with the mind, whether through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or, or whatever. All these things that come in, the mind clings to them, ident grabs them as mine, mine, mine. So we could say that because of ego, the mind takes the whole world as mine and then sticks it on its head. And with all this, with the whole world stuck on its head, ego is full of problems. This Having this world carried around on the head is a great burden. This is the flow of Bhaticca Samupada. This, does this flow of Bhaticca Samupada occur in, in my life? Does this flow occur in our daily lives? If you don't see this occurring within your own life, then you have yet to see Bhaticca Samupada and you don't understand Bhaticca Samupada at all. If one hasn't seen it occurring within one's own daily experience, then one has yet to understand it. But once one begins to see these conditions unfolding, this flow unfolding in our normal living, our normal experience, then we begin to, to, under, to understand it. This is something to be observed directly through, through one's personal inner experience. If you observe this, if you really see this in your own experience, then you'll know that it's true. And you'll know that what the Buddha said is true when he said that suffering does not occur because of actions in, in past lives, or that suffering is not caused by Isvara or, or God. You'll understand that suffering only occurs because of stupidity regarding the flow of Paticca Samupada, because of acting wrongly regarding the flow of, of Paticca Samupada. This is the only way that dukkha arises. You'll, you can see this for yourself. And so our duty then is to regulate or control the flow of Paticca Samupada so that suffering doesn't occur. How can we manage or how do we deal with this Paticca Samupada so that we prevent the arising of stupidity and suffering? This is our duty and this is the question now that we're faced with. How to prevent the arising of dukkha? In the Pali language, they use the word how to, how to block or how to dam the flow of Paticca Samupada. The meaning is how to, how to control it so this flow is within our our own grip so that we've got we've got control over it how to regulate it so that it's within our own power in particular we'll use mindfulness or sati to to block the flow of paticca samupada we'll use mindfulness the mindfulness that has been developed through practicing anapanasati, through correctly practicing mindfulness with breathing, mindfulness is developed. It's a result of anapanasati practice. And then we use that mindfulness to block the flow 
of Baticca Samupada. The, the point or the moment where it's most important to use mindfulness to block the flow of Baticca Samupada is the, the moment or the, the thing that we called Paksa, contact, as we've already explained. This is the point where we need mindfulness the most. We need mindfulness to regulate, to govern Paksa so that it doesn't become foolish and stupid. However, we don't have much mindfulness. We've never paid attention to being mindful. We haven't developed and trained mindfulness. So we don't have the mindfulness to regulate Patsa. This is, this is our problem. We need, we need mindfulness, but we don't have it. And so contact is generally stupid because we lack the mindfulness to govern it, to regulate it. What we call <coughs> sati, mindfulness. Sati has the meaning of speed. Sati has the same root. It's basically the same word as the word for arrow, which back in those days was fast. One of the fastest things they had around was an arrow. Sati was that which was quick and fast. Actually, it's, it's faster than an arrow. It's more like lightning bolts or lasers or things like this. Sati is this speed which can bring wisdom, bring knowledge. Any knowledge and understanding that we have can then be brought to the contact by sati so that the the contact is governed by wisdom, by correct understanding, rather than by ignorance. Sati, if it's going to work usefully, must have wisdom and understanding to bring to the contact. If there's no understanding to deliver, then sati works for nothing. But if sati also brings wisdom, correct understanding, we have actually lots of words for this in, in Pali. We've got panya, intuitive wisdom, or we have jnana, insight knowledge, or vicha, correct knowing. All of these, or any of them, whatever, we, if they're there to be delivered by sati, then there's no problem at Patsa. Now the question arises, where does this intuitive wisdom, these jnana and vicha and banya, where do they come from? They can be developed completely through the practice of anapanasati. In practicing mindfulness with breathing, sati is developed, then understanding Correct understanding is developed. Also what we call sampachanya, which is the specific application of wisdom. And then samadhi, the mind that is firm, clear, focused, active. All of these are developed through anapanasati, so we can have all of these four necessary tools. If we have these four, they're at patsa, if they've been developed, then they can all function and do their work at the moment of contact. And then contact is not foolish. We can even call it wise contact. And then any feeling that occurs will be wise. It won't be stupid in the least bit. Any wanting coming regarding that feeling will be wise. It won't be foolish craving. And then if there is the upadana will not be stupid, 
If there is upadana, any kind of attachment there, it will be wise attachment. In this way, by having mindfulness bring correct wisdom, bringing correct understanding, none of this is stupid anymore. It's, it's all wise. And so there's no more stupidity from contact to feeling to craving to attachment and so on. So that's not even craving, it's just wise want. Now we, we shouldn't overlook a very natural low level of wisdom that occurs almost instinctually because this is quite useful and valuable and it's for now what most of us have to work with. This basic level of wisdom a kind of natural instinctual wisdom is when we make a mistake at patsa and there's foolish patsa, foolish feeling, attachment, ego, and then dukkha. The mind doesn't like this dukkha. It's chastened by this dukkha. And it learns a lesson there. This lesson of, of suffering chastens the mind and then it's not, it's afraid to do that again. This, this too is a kind of wisdom when the mind is chastened by, by dukkha. And we shouldn't overlook this because this instinctual kind of understanding can be developed and can be quite useful. Even, even animals have this, this kind of wisdom. They, they can learn lessons like this but it's not sufficient. Then there are certain difficulties regarding sati also. We should take note of these. Often sati isn't fast enough. It's not right in time, not just in time at the moment of contact. It comes in a little too late or sometimes even a few days too late. And so sati needs to be developed so that it's fast enough to be just in time when it's needed. Otherwise it doesn't, it can't bring wisdom in at the moment that wisdom is needed. So now we've got, <clears throat> we have mindfulness and we have wisdom. <clears throat> So when there is contact, mindfulness is fast enough to get wisdom and bring it right where it's needed. The particular wisdom that sati brings for this specific contact we call sampachanya, of all wisdom that is all the understanding possible, the specific knowledge needed to govern contact we call sampachanya. So sati brings that particular wisdom to the contact and then this sampachanya acts to regulate the contact so that nothing foolish occurs. Now there is, wisdom is vast. There are all kinds of knowledges and things to know. Sati know, has to know how to choose the right wisdom to bring it to the contact. This specific wisdom is then sampachanya. Wisdom in general is called panya. It's the same as a medicine chest that you have in your house, full up with all kinds of different medicines. When there's an illness, we need to choose the right medicine for the specific situation. You don't take out the whole medicine chest. Use the specific medicine or drug or whatever that's called for. Or it's like we have a huge arsenal full of all kinds of different weapons. But we need to choose the right weapon to destroy this particular enemy. 
And so this is how, how it works. Sati has to be trained so that it's not only quick enough to bring wisdom, but also Sati has to know how to choose the right knowledge, the right wisdom for this particular situation. There are many, many different kinds of cases that Sati must deal with and it needs to bring the, the correct wisdom to deal with this specific case. And that wisdom is called Sampa Chanyan. It's, we're not sure if it's amusing or pitiful that people these days have got so much knowledge and so much wisdom because of modern education, modern communications, people are so full up with wisdom and knowledge that it's become tangled and confused. It's not only all mixed up together, but it's also excessive. People have got often too much knowledge. And so mindfulness is unable to choose the right kind of knowledge. You can't find the knowledge it needs in all that mess that most of us have got. This is the result of the kind of education we now have. So those who are searching for knowledge, please, please improve your way of seeking knowledge so that the knowledge and wisdom that is developed is in a form that can be used so that it's not excessive, so it doesn't get all tangled up and become just a big unusable mess of facts and everything that doesn't do us any good. So please straighten out this, this situation. Anapanasati is something that can help us to do so, to develop both mindfulness which is fast enough and accurate as well as knowledge which is correct, practical and which we can use where it's needed. You can see for yourself that now the education systems we have are truly marvelous. They're huge universities all over the places, thousands, tens of thousands of universities scattered around the world and schools all over the place. You can see that the result is we have enormous knowledge. We've learned so many, many things. But in examining this you can also see quite clearly that all these universities, all these schools and all this knowledge that we've got has yet been completely unable to bring peace. We've got all this knowledge, but it seems it's just about useless in bringing peace to the world. So something, something funny is going on. We've got this knowledge, but it, it's not able to bring peace. We don't have, it doesn't include training in mindfulness. And this knowledge isn't correct. It doesn't help individual people to solve their problems. All this knowledge we've got doesn't help us to deal with the problems of daily life. And so we're unable to prevent suffering. And so if we can't bring peace to individuals, if individuals can't get free of their, their individual suffering, how can we bring peace to the world. If the individuals aren't at peace, how can we find peace on a world scale? This is just a clear example of how all this knowledge, this tangled knowledge, can, can be practically worthless for dealing with the real problems in life. Instead, all this knowledge is just used to create new newer things, bigger things, inventing more fancy, more enticing things. And so often, not only does this knowledge 
that is a result of modern education. Not only does this knowledge often fail to solve our problems that we've already got, this knowledge also is used to create new problems. This is an example to point out the, the need for proper mindfulness and proper, proper knowledge, knowledge that can really help us. If there is mindfulness, correct knowledge, wisdom, understanding, then we can govern, we can regulate patsa, we can control it so that no suffering arises. If people in this world understood this, knew this, then people would not suffer. And if there was no suffering in individual lives, then, then peace would not disappear. Peace would be right there in these lives that are free of suffering. Through, in this way, world peace is simple. We can have complete world peace through individual people having enough mindfulness and proper wisdom in order to regulate, control patsa. But nowadays, we don't have the wisdom, we don't have the mindfulness, we don't have the sampachanya, and so there's no peace in the world, and things are even, even getting worse. So this shows the importance of training in developing, finding this, this mindfulness which is fast enough and wisdom which is proper to deal with the specific cases that occur in our daily lives. This point is so important that we can say if one can control panza, then we can control the world. You can have power over the entire world just by controlling Patsa. If we can keep Patsa under control, then anything in the world that comes and makes contact will not have the power to cause suffering. No dukkha will arise out of those Patsa, so the world is within our control. This is a very marvelous thing which requires our interest. We must have wicca, which is knowing correctly, proper knowledge. This is the opposite of the avicca or ignorance we mentioned before. Wicca is to know things correctly, to know what needs to be known properly. This must be this must be a subjective knowledge or intuitive knowledge, an inner knowledge. In Pali we have the word santitiko, santitiko, which means to to see clearly and know distinctly, know know directly inside, <laughs> to see clearly and know directly inside the truth of the way of how things are. This, if this, if knowledge is santitiko, then it is truly vicha, correct knowledge, right knowing, which is what, what we're in need of. This word Vicha or Vicha, V-I-J-J-A, is an excellent word. The word we or the particle we means clearly, directly, and cha means to know. So Vicha simply means to know clearly, know directly, know immediately within. This Vicha is what is, is the goal of Buddhism. This is what Buddhists are looking for, are practicing for, to have vicha, the correct knowledge which can stop the flow of Bhatichya Samupada, the, cor the direct 
inner understanding which is right there at contact so that nothing foolish arises. But now all we've got is avicca, not knowing. Or we've got knowledge which is incorrect, it's not clear. Or we've got knowledge which isn't direct, it's merely second hand. So if all we have is incorrect or not knowing, then we, we're helpless. We can't stop the flow of paticca samupada. So vicha is something that is incredibly important, absolutely necessary, if human life is to be at peace. Vicha is like day. Avicha is like light, is, is like night, is like the darkness. Vicha and Avicha are opposites in this way, like day and night. But there's another word, sunlight, aloko. Sunlight, aloko, is another synonym for Vicha. And there are many words like this which are all synonyms for correct knowing. There's panya, intuitive wisdom, vicha, aloko, sunlight, which are all specifically meaning this knowledge which is direct, clear, and sufficient. It has to be complete enough to do its job. So, in summary, vicha is what blocks or controls, regulates the flow of Bhatitya Samupada through the power of Sati. With, through mindfulness, correct, under, correct knowledge stops the flow of Bhatitya Samupada, regulates it so that there's no dukkha. This is the summary of what we've been talking about today. And since it's going to rain, so we'll, we'll end today's talk at this point and continue again tomorrow.